with these kind of books with the Course, we're starting to realize, wow, it's really simple. I'm going to have to unplug my mind from the ego and the whole cosmos in order to be free and happy and joyous. When God said, hold no graven images before the Lord thy God, he wasn't talking about golden calves. He wasn't talking about totem poles. He was talking about the entire <laughs> cosmos. Hold no graven images before the Lord thy God. So now we start to see the task mm -hmm. in front of us. It's just like my friend Gary says in Art and Persa, the disappearance of the universe is a realistic possibility in your life. Not that you will make the, the uh, universe disappear, but by following the Holy Spirit and letting your mind become healed and whole, of course the stars will go out. You know, uh, like that song, If. Anyone remember that by David Gates and Brett? One by one the stars will all go out, then you and I will simply fly away. Yes, that's it. Even Brett had it right. <laughs> the stars are going out and so are all the planets and everything and with this hallucination. So, hmm? Well, it's symbolic, it's kind of like a Tinkerbell <laughs> kind of thing, but in the end we, we don't fly anywhere, but we just are one with God, uh, which we've always been, so there's not like any kind of a, a movement, but it's just more of a recognition. Enlightenment is but a recognition, not a change at all. So it's not really even a flying away, but it's just easing back into that truth. So. Okay, that got us going. We have, we've kind of looked a little bit about sickness, at bringing it back into the mind. If you bring it back into the mind, um, Suzanne in the morning group was in here was mentioning in the back of Awakening Through A Course of Miracles, I asked the Holy Spirit and Jesus for a map of the mind. Because I, I like graphics. Even when I was in school, I always had crayons and was like, drawing things, I said, give me a picture. Can you, can you give me a picture? This is getting to be a little ethereal here. Uh, can you give me a picture? And so, definitely, we have a picture. This is our power of prayer in the middle, then we've got the ring here. I got our concentric rings. This is our desire, our power of prayer in the middle. Here's our beliefs. People always say, where are my beliefs? Here's our thoughts. Here's our emotions. Here's our perceptions. You've got to get inside here. It's like anybody who watched Star Trek, the first edition of Star Trek had, who was in charge of the engine room? Um, Scotty. Scotty. Yeah. Captain! He was Scottish. <laughs> Captain, we've got a breach at the core. That never sounded good, did it? When you, whenever, whenever Scotty said that to Captain James Kirk, Captain, we've got a breach at the core. It's like, uh oh, the ship could explode. And I, I like Star Trek. No, it can't happen. I don't want the, don't want the ship to blow up. Uh, this is desire, and you know what Jesus has to say about desire? He says, "Truth will be returned to your awareness by your desire." as it was lost by your desire for something else. You think if desire is important, 
truth, he's talking truth, will be returned to your awareness by your desire. Not by your belief. He doesn't say belief. He doesn't say your thoughts. He doesn't say anything about your emotions. Definitely nothing about your perceptions. Like climbing, climbing up a big mountain here. Nope, nothing about that. Swimming through the ocean to get salvation. Nope, nothing about that. Truth will be returned to your awareness by your desire, as it was lost by your desire for something else. Right outside, what is this desire? Well, in heaven, desire is completely unified, so there's no such thing as desire. You might say heaven is desirelessness. Doesn't that make sense? Heaven is everything, so you don't have any desires in heaven. You, have, you know that you're one with God. What would you possibly desire if you know that you're everything? You couldn't possibly desire anything. There's no such thing as desire in heaven. But in terms of the sleeping mind, this is the point of prayer. This is your prayer point down here. This is desire. And belief, the first belief that ever seemed to arise, not in reality, but in psychosis and schizophrenia, is the ego. And this ego belief generated lots of thoughts, a whole thought system, based on the belief in separation. And then these thoughts generated a lot of emotions. Fear, guilt, shame, pain, uh, anything you can imagine, what we call the negative emotions, are all generated from this belief in separation. Everything that is a negative emotion is generated. And then an entire world, the mountains, the oceans, the stars, the stars, the planets, <laughs> it looks like an A. an A. But we have planets and this, okay, so put Saturn up there, and you got all kinds of planets and everything. The whole cosmos. It looks like a confist. This, over here, this is a black hole. Even the black hole is a projection. It's all out here, is all the projection. And so, the best thing I can say about the map of the mind is, the arrow goes this way. The perceptions are brought about by the emotions. There's a ring of fear under this world. Love doesn't make this world go round, like the romantic songs say. There's a ring of fear underneath this world. That's what's making this world. It shouldn't be too surprising with all the wars and plagues and pestilence and everything that's going on, you know, in, in throughout human history. So the emotions are producing the perceptions. The emotions are being determined by the thoughts. You ever meet those people along the way that go, feel your way to God. Just feel it. <laughs> you, you go along and you start to have a conversation and they go, David, feel the feelings. Feel your way to God. Well, like sometimes they call them the touchy-feely people. But, the emotions are part of the equation, no doubt. The feelings and the emotions are part of it. But you see where they are in the equation. They come on an outer ring outside of cognition. Outside of thoughts. You know, sometimes you hear people say, get out of your head and get into your heart. Has anybody ever heard that, a spiritual journey? The longest journey you'll ever take was just the 15 inches from your head to your heart. You're not finished. It goes the other way around. You've got to get out of your fearful emotions and get back into your what? Your thoughts. You've got to get inside there to the cognition because the thoughts are producing the emotions. Now, is it important to feel the feelings? Of course. If you're up here and you think you're a human being and you've got, you've forgotten all about all this stuff and you're just kind of distracted, you know, wandering through the world. I'm working my job. Collect my pay. <laughs> Believe I'm gliding down the highway. Let's give him a car. But in fact, slip sliding away. 
slip sliding away. If you think you're out here, and you just think that this is all that there is, in this world, up here, then basically you've got to start to, to come underneath and go into your mind, and that's where getting in touch with the emotions help bring you, it's like an inroad. The Holy Spirit's going to say, let's go like this, we've got to go back inside got to go inside your mind, inside your consciousness, and back towards this core desire power. This is the only place you're going to be still and know God, is down here at the core. But everything out here is produced by what's underneath it. And even when you get in touch with your thoughts, you can believe things about your thoughts that aren't true. You can actually believe that your thoughts are ineffectual. Isn't that a pretty common belief? How many people do you know that, that when you talk about wars in the Middle East or in Iraq and Iran, they go, oh yeah, those are my attack thoughts. I'm doing it. I'm completely behind the, the Middle East conflict and the, the Iraq conflict. How many people are admitting, have you met any, that say, oh it's my attack thoughts. It's not Osama bin Laden. It's my attack thoughts. Well, what about Mussolini? Well, yeah, that was my attack thoughts too. I, I'm responsible for all the ones in history. Well, what about Hitler? Oh, yep. They, they admit it. They say, yeah, that was my attack thoughts. The Third Reich? It was, yeah, that was my attack thoughts. You see, this is buried down there. The, the attack thoughts are making up this whole world. In fact, Jesus says history wouldn't even exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. It's like on a loop of, of making a wrong-minded choice, and that's what linear time is. It's just this wrong-minded decision playing out over and over and over. One instant repeated over and over. The unholy instant of time and space of the ego just getting played over and over and over. And meanwhile, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are calling us back into the core, so we can come back to heaven. So you can believe things about your thoughts. For most people we could say they do not believe that their thoughts are powerful enough to change the world. Or to mess the world up, or to help the world, or to improve. Anything that they believe about their thoughts is usually it's like there's just these little things whirling around in the mind which they associate with the brain and and most people feel it's good things that people don't know what's going on in there because if people knew what was going on they'd know how crazy I was. That's usually the extent of, of that with thoughts. So there we go, down, down, down. So in the end, when we talk about forgiveness, forgiveness is is a belief here. We could say that if we took a cross-section cut across here, we'll say that when all of these rings are completely lined up through desire, this is where the willingness comes from, the little willingness, but we would say that, that forgiveness is the belief and your real thoughts, we'll call them real thoughts here, the emotion is love, and the perception is, we'll just call it healed perception. Um, the, this is a miracle, when all of these are lined up with the Holy Spirit. And that just shows that all of these have to come from a willingness to be healed in here, and then everything else lines up. So, to me that was really helpful. When I, when I got in touch with this, it was like, I'm kind of, I always consider myself very graphic, and that was like, wow, I, I would have loved that map early in my life, because that could have helped cleared up a lot of confusion when I was out there on the surface trying to fix things, change things, make the world a better place. I got involved in, I was an activist, you know, stop nuclear proliferation, end world hunger, you know, all getting involved in ecology and on and on and on. There's a lot of effort that I put into
trying to make the world a better place and, and I really have to say honestly I didn't have a clue of what was going on under the surface, underneath in my consciousness. But once I got a hold of the Course, it's like it made it a real straight shot to God because it's so, you can just feel it in your core of your being like, whoa, there's actually someone who, who really knows the way out. And, and the gratitude for that way shower, you know, is just, for me it was enormous, you know, to actually have someone who knew, who's been through it all and knows the way out. Of course that presence could say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, because it was, it is the way, the truth, and the life, and it, it's beautiful to have such a clear expression. Um, that kind of leads to kind of a concept where you don't really need to go out and demonstrate or change the world or you can do it all from home, but it's kind of that you're the only one in that there is nobody else, there is, well there is no universe I guess, it's, it's kind of, I don't know, but that's, it's, it's a difficult thing for your mind to grasp anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it seems, it actually seems difficult but then when you start to open towards it, you start to realize that the difficult thing is resisting the oneness. Like if oneness is all that there is, really, and we resist it, which would, we would be the, when the ego is fighting for its own sense of separate identity, it's a little bit like the Star Trek episode, you know, they had all the Klingons <coughs> and the Romulans and everything. I think the most terrifying enemy was the Borg. Because it was the collective, you know, the one. They all were completely linked. And Picard and the Enterprise was all like fighting for individuality, <laughs> fighting off this oneness. And in one sense, I always laughed with that because still you have two enemies there, and two, two that are fighting each other. The collective is still just a construct as well. But, but it's, it's actually more difficult to fight against healing than it is to surrender into it. And I've got some good clips, we'll probably watch some of those, uh, some Star Trek episodes tonight. Uh, but, but actually, when you think about, wow, I can't even begin to grasp or wrap this idea of, of oneness, you don't have to try to jump from A to Z, you just have to be willing to move in that direction. And that's where you're given a function that you can understand in terms, earth terms. You know, it may be a teacher of God, it may be a healer, a minister of God. You know, there's lots of words you can give to it. Just like we have different people in spirituality that we are kind of known for their different gifts and, and abilities. But what I found is it was much more difficult for me to resist the awakening than it was for me to surrender into it where I had to cross over like a threshold. At one point I was like thinking, this is too big, it's too much, I'll never be able to do this. How did you pick me? Why did you pick me? You've got the wrong one. I'm just a regular guy. I am not Moses. You know, this <laughs> one. You've got to have made the wrong. Jesus is like, oh no. I don't make mistakes. Uh, I am calling you. <laughs> Okay, uh, and then the next big round of resistance was, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. If, if, you're, if you're recruiting miracle workers, oh man, you've got the wrong guy. <laughs> I am not. Have you met my parents? <laughs> you, do you think I have some kind of good gene pool for miracle working or something here? You know, no, it's not. I have called you and you are ready. What do you say uh, to that? I have called you and you are ready. You know, yes, you have to say yes. You have to be like Jim Carrey in Yes Man. Mm, yes! <laughs>
all of the perceptual problems of the world, whether we talk about weather, climate related ones like floods and tsunamis and hurricanes and typhoons and tornadoes, whether we talk about diseases like cancer, heart disease, AIDS, whether we talk about financial problems, economic conditions around the world, whether we talk about poverty, world hunger, um, uh, terrorism, uh, wars, uh, fill it in. Anything you can conceive of in your mind that you've been conditioned to with time and space as a problem on any scale or any magnitude it's all out here on the screen and gently the Holy Spirit keeps singing this song to the mind. That's not the reason why. The problem is not out there, you have to look inside. And, and here not only is the Holy Spirit telling us to look inside, but the Holy Spirit has given us the steps the things you have to move through to come down, to find the solution <coughs> in the mind, the atonement, the correction to this error, this erroneous perception, these erroneous rings, you know, there's none of these rings, there's none of this in heaven, but this is like a tool for rapidly sending you back into find the correction in your own mind, like Jesus. He simply accepted the atonement of the correction for false belief and uh, he did it for all of us and now he's just given us such a clear roadmap. This is like a detailed clear roadmap. So anyone who has a, a willingness and desire, you know, you've got the ways made clear.